I've got no monitor out here. Sorry, I can't see whether we're on or off. But, hey, what's new? Revelation TV is live, and it's the 19th of April. We've had an exciting day, and so has everybody else in Christian television. If you're watching, uh, it's interesting to know what is the truth and what isn't anymore. But never mind, there's always UFOs out there. If you don't know the difference between UFOs and uh, UCOs, uh, give us a call afterwards. Unidentified Christian organizations who may be anonymous, uh, who may want to remain anonymous, who knows? Very interesting days. Lies going about, truth going about, who knows the truth and the lies but the Heavenly Father. But hey, we're not here to debate that. What we're here is really to look at subjects that really touch everyday interest. Now, there are many people looking at the paranormal, many people looking into the supernatural, many people want to know what's the meaning of life. And is there life out there? Is there life beyond the grave? Is there life that are in other parts of the universe? Our universe is so small, insignificant, you might think. Just a pinhead in the whole particular cosmos. I, I can't think of any other word. I'm sure uh, our intelligence uh, sitting on the opposite side of me right now will have more to say because he's written a book. It's Gary Bates. Welcome to the program, Gary. Thanks, Howard. Now, tell us the title of this book as I hold it up so that someone can get a shot of this. Okay, it's called Alien Intrusion, UFOs and the Evolution Connection. Right, say it again for those who... Alien are... Intrusion, UFOs and the Evolution Connection. Right. What is the connection? Because you're from, uh, you know, Answers in Genesis, which yep. I know very well, Ken Ham, had on the yes. program many times. Um, people want to know truth, and sometimes it's, it's very vague. When we're talking about things which are outside of our natural realm and where we can't see something and we can't touch it, uh, we are very sceptical, and quite rightly so. We're British. <laughs> no, that's true. Well, the first place to start really is that uh, most people today, I mean, if you did polls of Western audiences, they would say that somewhere between 80 to 90 percent of people in Western countries believe that there is extraterrestrial life out there. And I find for Christians in particular that poses an issue of you know, if the RETs, you know, do they fit in the Bible? How do you look at the big picture of the gospel uh, with extraterrestrials involved, etc.? But uh, most of that thinking comes from two areas. Uh, and uh, certainly if you looked at the premier space agency in the world today, NASA, they're spending billions of dollars searching for extraterrestrial life under their Origins program. Now, the, the expression Origins, although they're looking out there, is really an answer for meaning to life, as you mentioned, because what they're trying to do is say, well, if life evolved on the Earth, which the majority of people believe, something I don't subscribe to and Answers in Genesis don't subscribe to. Me neither. Okay, but if life evolved on the Earth, Howard, they extrapolate that in this enormous, vast universe, it must have happened somewhere else. Yeah. And so if there is life out there, it could be a billion years more advanced in front of us, for example, and that might tell us how we got here. Now, one of the, a very popular view with scientists today, serious scientists, is that aliens are our creators. You know, in a distant past, alien astronauts came to the Earth, seeded life on Earth, you know, you, uh, your viewers may have heard of Eric Von Daniken, for example, his old famous book, Chariots of the Gods. He said the sons of God in Genesis 6 were really space aliens and, you know, oversaw our evolution or tinkered with our genes, something like that. Well, it's interesting because I've been reading on that again just recently because I'm trying to write a script for a children's uh, program, Christian television, Why Did God Send the, the Big Flood? And in there I came across in Genesis 6 that, that where it mentions uh, that the sons of God uh, came down to the earth and saw the good-looking women and men and uh, obviously one would, you know, be able to say from that scripture or that there is a possibility that they had intercourse with those... Mm. Uh, earthly women and produce the Nephilim, which are mighty yeah. men, giants. Now, maybe people might think, yes, you know, that's maybe the origins of where Greek gods and goddesses came in. Well, Roman legends and Greek legends are in fact um, almost the same in this regard. They have, I think, uh, the Titans, for example, uh, that, you know, were intermarrying with half god, half humans, and they produced an offspring. And in fact, those offspring, as the same uh, as the Bible records, are now locked up. Sorry, not the offspring, offspring but the, uh, the godlike creatures, if you like, are locked up in Tartarus. In exactly. Talks and about so, it in the New yeah, Testament. so it's very, very similar. Mm. But, um, you know, I think, I mean, there are four views on there. It's a highly controversial passage. Uh, I have my views. I tend to, Howard, you know, take a very plain view of Scripture. I mean, people say, well, you take a literal view. I'd even say I don't take a literal view. I actually try to take the view that I think the author intended. So, for example, if you looked in those days of Genesis, 
you know, we go through these mental and theolo theological gymnastics to say, well, could those days be millions of years or billions of years, and can we insert gaps in between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2? And the plainest meaning of the Hebrew word day, for example, um, uh, yom, almost entirely throughout the Old Testament, literally means 24 hours. You have evening and morning the first day, evening and morning the second day, clearly means a literal day. Now, I don't limit God to, you know, uh, saying, well, he could have done it in a billion years or he could have done it in a million years. I'm really interested in what God said he did. And if I looked at those days in Genesis, that's what I believe he said he did. Now, similarly, the reason I mention that, if you looked at the sons of God in Genesis 6, everywhere throughout the entire Old Testament, the sons of God means angels. Exactly. Now, it, of course, it provides huge problems with us with the idea that we think angels are... Perfect. Well, some sort of ethereal spirit beings or, you know, an incapable of this physical manifestation. Now, I don't have the answers there, but I, my personal view, but not necessarily that of the ministry I might point out, but my personal view is those sons of God were angels uh, and some way they, they managed to do this. Yeah. Now, think about this, though. As I said, we sometimes think angels are just these ethereal spirit beings, but everywhere an angel is recorded manifesting in Scripture... He looks like a human being or a male. So he somehow dematerialized from some sort of spirit being into some sort of... Well, I think my, my personal view is that their spirit and their flesh or, or some physical being. I mean, even if we take the resurrected Lord, you know, he exactly. appeared to Thomas and yeah. Thomas put his finger here and, he, and his, his hand in his side. So he was able to touch Jesus and yet Jesus was actually able to suddenly appear in the room of the disciples and disappear. He, ate on, he sat on the shores of Galilee and ate fish. Think about the three visitors to Abraham. They sat down and ate food with Abraham. Now, do they have real digestive Boys, tracts and yeah. stomach organ organs? I don't think we'll know this side of glory, to be honest. But there is that possibility, and it seemed that they were capable of de dematerializing and taking on human form, which is what Genesis 6 says. And that gives way to a speculation that there is life out there which people who haven't read the Bible would say, well, you know, that gives, that's evidence that there is other intelligent life out there somewhere and they must be residing somewhere. They don't think about um, heaven as being perhaps a place where just spirits uh, reside. Well, life, life elsewhere in the universe can only get there really by two ways. And either it evolved there the same way that it evolved on Earth or either God put it there. Now, when I, I've given a lot of talks on this subject, and probably the number one question I get from even Christians is, you know, why couldn't have God created life on other planets? And if I could just spend a minute extrapolating yeah, why I don't think that is possible, because a lot of people say to me, you know, well, Gary, you know, the Bible is silent on aliens, therefore it could mean that aliens exist. But that's really an argument from silence, because I could just as easily say, well, the Bible is silent on aliens because there aren't any. Now, if we look at the big picture of the Gospel, Adam's sin... It says in Rome, you know, we understand from Romans 8, Adam sinned, the whole creation groans and travails under the weight of sin. So let me, let me put it this way for all the Star Trekkies out there. If, uh, if you've got Mr. Spock out there on planet Vulcan, he's been affected by Adam's curse through no fault of his own. Moreover, you've got to be a physical descendant of Adam to be saved. Jesus was the last Adam, the Bible writes. Why was that? To overturn the effects of the first Adam. So there's got to be a real Adam in history. Then this heavens, all this creation is going to get destroyed in a fervent heat and there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth. So you've got Mr. Spock affected by the curse through no fault of his own. He doesn't have any chance of salvation. And then he gets rubbed out in the end with no hope of that. And then there's more. See, the Bible says Jesus died once for all. Now, is he going to go to what, all lots of other planets and be crucified all and, and resurrected here. again? And, and the church, we're called the bride of Christ. We are the redeemed church, his bride throughout eternity. Now, I believe that's a symbol of that monogamous relationship that we have with Christ. He's not going to go and have lots of other brides on other planets. And we at the church is really born out of his flesh, out of his side, out of the wounds, the same way that Eve, if you like, was born out of Adam's side. And so I think that pretty much effectively eliminates the idea of, you know, alien races elsewhere. What comes to mind immediately, Gary, is that if God regretted making man, as he said in Genesis 6, surely he wouldn't go and do it somewhere else. Or if he had done it, he wouldn't be saying that he'd made man because he'd already said, well, let me go back to planet Z or Zeon and uh, leave these guys alone because this will all come to an end anyway, 2 Peter 3. But what I am interested in is how we reach our audience tonight Gary, because there are people that watch this channel who are not Christian. And there are those Christians who, you know, believe in all sorts of things. So looking at the audience that could be there, that yes, intelligent audience wanting to find um, the purpose of life and 
you know, with all sincerity, looking to see if there is some th hope out there. Because if there is, as the, the papers have said recently, um, something that's coinciding or coexisting, another universe w right alongside ours, ready almost to take over so we have some sort of salvation outside of Jesus Christ. Um, what would you say to them? Well, maybe you could use this subject matter because, for example, that's, that's why I went in it. One of the most asked questions we get now in Answers in Genesis is what about UFOs? Now, this modern UFO phenomenon has been occurring for, uh, you know, hundreds, even thousands of years, if you like, as far as we've got recorded history. Romans, Greeks saw flying shields with occupants in them. American Indians saw canoes, they said, with occupants in them. And even today, in our technological age, we still get about 150 sightings a day Many can be explained, but there's a small percentage that can't be explained. And even the leading researchers, the movers and shakers, these are guys that have done you know, investigations for the government, their conclusions, because these things change shape, they, they merge into one another, American fighter pilots have been up and shot can't at them. keep up, up with them. So what they've actually said is they, they exist in a paranormal or paraphysical realm. Now, as a Christian, I would substitute that word and say spiritual because I, I have biblical glasses. So we have a reality that's occurring with, with UFOs and people around the world, Howard, are claiming that little grey entities are standing at the bottom of their bed in the middle of the night and visiting them. Now, I approach this subject, you know, I work with a, a scientific organisation pretty much as that was the psychological delusion of UFO wannabes, but I have to tell you, it's not. And there are some very, very serious things going on. These people are never the same after they, sometimes they develop occultic... Uh, you know, powers for one of the one of the better word, and so it, even these uh, movers and shakers have realised that there is a dimension, if you like, that you can't empirically test. You can't put this dimension in a test tube and test it, if you like. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, you know, they invoke the ideas of other universes, other dimensions. But so, if you can't empirically test it, you, as a scientist, okay, you're talking about a spiritual realm. You've got to go to a source that explains the spiritual realm. And the only thing that satisfactorily answers this whole phenomenon I found is the Bible. Because it tells you where this battle occurred right back in the beginning. It tells you that there is a spiritual battle going on. And at stake are the souls of human beings at the centre of this battle. And so what we are seeing is a deception. We see in the Middle Ages these types of visitations occurring. But they occur in a, a spiritual or a, an angelic or fairies or elves or sylphs trying to deceive people. Today they appear as if you like, as uh, glorious aliens from another planet, because by and large, most people don't believe in the supernatural. Right. I've been at conferences and I've had UFO believers come up and they say, well, we love the Bible, but you Christians have got it wrong, because Jesus actually was actually an advanced extraterrestrial. The reason he could perform all of his miracles is because he was having power beamed to him by the mothership. So some of these beliefs now are really directly challenging Christianity. And in fact, I've discovered that the fastest growing religious cults in the world today are the UFO cults fastest growing ones in the world today. But it shows people are interested in something supernatural and after all our, the God that we serve who created us is supernatural. He is the greatest scientist to me. I'm not a very intelligent person but the way I would best describe him is someone to me who is alien in the sense that he's not of, of us although we're made in his image mm. but he's something outside of our, our thinking. His ways are higher than ours and if he created us, even with the complexity that we have in our DNA alone, mm. uh, it just blows my mind and I know that I know that I know. And I've also actually experienced a couple of visitations. I've had three visitations in my life, two of which are, were very positive. One which was, I think, from a demonic source and very frightening. Now, maybe we could talk about these and other people that have got had these experiences and I know we've got a lot of material to go through, we've got some clips to go through, but I want to say that we're thinking of actually extending this program but obviously not until maybe 12 midnight. And Gary can stay here, we just got to find him a taxi that's, uh, you know, we just uh, pray for that. Uh, maybe Mark could, uh, if he's listening, Mark the cabbie, give us a call uh, on I've got the to number. Catch a flight to Canada in the morning so I need right, to Right, so uh, make sure it has uh, good, good wings so that it can make a quick uh, escape, especially if it's uh, shaped like Ezekiel's chariot, which we'll talk about later on because that's another uh, uh, reason why people think there are UFOs because good old Ezekiel, he escaped uh, pretty fast out of this place. Mm. Now, uh, Gary, the first clip that we're going to look at, tell us about it. Okay, this is about SETI. 
and this is the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Uh, it's a very costly program. It's been running a long time, and uh, I think the clip will, will be self-explanatory. What have they found? OK, let's have a look at this. SETI, sit down and watch. But there is a search going on, another serious search, and I'm sure most of you have heard of SETI, the search for extraterrestrial inter intelligence. This was funded with billions of dollars of taxpayers' money. It lost, uh, lost favour, they didn't find anything. And recently, uh, NASA have resumed funding. And a congressman in America said, well, you know, it should match public interest. So therefore, NASA have been uh, really forced to resume funding, plus they're jumping and, and piggybacking on the SETI idea because it is so popular. People like Steven Spielberg, Paul Allen, co-founder of Microsoft, have all invested millions of dollars into the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. And you can actually log on as a home user. There are millions of PC users around the world analysing all the data that's received via SETI. But you know, under Project Phoenix, part of the SETI program, they've been spending billions of dollars, OK? They have millions of participants worldwide been scanning 28 million radio frequencies a second for 40 years, and how many messages do you think they've received? Not one. Think about it, 28 million radio frequencies every second for 40 years, but never one intelligent coded message, because that's what they need. To recognize intelligence, the message would have to be coded. You'd have to see ordered sequences of uh, letters or some language to understand that it came from an intelligent source. Actually, they did receive one uh, message from space they got excited about. Originally, it was called LGM-1. And what do you think LGM-1 stands for? Little green men. <laughs> True. But it was found to be a pulsar. And what a pulsar is, it's a, uh, a collapsed a star. And for example, you know, a teaspoon of this stuff would probably weigh, you know, a billion tons or something like that. But it's called a pulsar because it rapidly rotates and it pulses. It gives off a radio signal, and that's uh, really what they found. But a significant point here, folks, you know, with NASA and SETI, they're spending billions of dollars. So for all you conspiracy theorists out there, if they've already acknowledged extraterrestrial life and it's hidden in Area 51 somewhere, why are they spending the money? Not only that, if there's 150 sightings average visiting us every day or aliens visiting us every day in their spaceships, why do we not see them on radar entering the atmosphere? Never once. We do see UFOs on radar, by the way. And uh, although most of them can be explained by natural phenomenon, they, um, many of them have disappeared off radar, radar. American fighter jets, for example, have gone up, sighted them, fired at them. They've disappeared. They've merged together. They've morphed. They've changed shape you'll get some idea of where we're heading with that sort of information. So think about this coded information that SETI needs to have to, to recognize uh, extraterrestrial intelligence. Well, you can see the heading there, the most complex information storage mechanism in the universe. What do you think I'm going to show you? DNA, the DNA molecule, extremely complex uh, in terms of the information that you can store on there. Because many people have the idea, people like Von Daniken, you might remember, very, very popular. He said, you know, the sons of God in Genesis 6 were actually extraterrestrials that visited the earth and mated with humans and directed evolution, etc., or something like that. But if you want signs of intelligence, you shouldn't be looking out there. You should be looking here. How much information do you think, and some of you have been to our answers in Genesis conferences, you'd know, could you store on, an, on a pinhead of DNA? If I could type out all the information into books, per se, and I was to make a pile of books, how high, how much information, how high would the pile be of books for all that information? Now I've been around and people say, oh, a metre high, two metres high, as high as the ceiling or whatever. Well, do you know, you could amass a pile of books 240 times to the moon and back in just a pinhead of DNA. And SETI are looking for complex coded information Intelligent, intelligence out there when they really should be swapping their telescopes for microscopes because a, an infinite intelligence has already streamed millions of encyclopedias worth of information to the earth. Would you agree? Wow. The complex information just in the DNA in a pinhead's worth, that's phenomenal. I mean, what was before man? Because I know a lot of people can't comprehend 
you know, that life just suddenly came into existence, or even before the universe. Where, where did time begin? And if exactly. God was in the beginning, where, who made him? That's exactly right. Well, if I could explain it this way, and this would help people understand, as a, a scientific principle that every beginning has a cause. I'll just repeat that. Every beginning has a cause. You and I have a beginning, Howard, and we have a cause. This uh, TV studio has a beginning, and it has a cause. So if I asked you, does the universe have a beginning? It has to. Has to have a beginning. Yeah, because and therefore it has... it has a cause. Now the only two explanations you can come up with is that either matter itself is eternal. But as we just saw from that clip, you see, matter cannot rearrange itself into complex living organisms. You know, when you look at that book and you see all those letters on the page, okay, the information is there, but the letters have to be ordered precisely to make a sentence. DNA is like that. There's letters of information, but they have to be ordered precisely to tell the cells what to build, whether you're going to be a frog or a fish or whatever. But whenever you see a sentence on a page, that's not the information itself. It's always a sign of a greater intelligence that's put the information there. Coded. So when you look at... That's right, it's coded information. So when you see DNA, you know, this complex coded information cannot arise by chance. It's always a sign of a greater intelligence that's put it there. Now, the other explanation, as I say, matter itself is not suitable, is there has to be a supernatural being before the universe began. And that, like you said, see, I would say to people, people ask, well, where was God in the beginning? Well, God has no beginning, therefore he doesn't need a cause, okay? And also, if you consider time, people say, well, you know, does God exist a billion years in the past or a billion years in the future? Well, he is timeless. In fact, time only began when the physical universe was created. We are products of that physical universe, and so therefore it's very, very hard to understand things beyond our physical universe. But we know the universe had a beginning, and therefore somebody had to be outside of it to bring it into being, because it is not self-existent. Can the mind play tricks on us? Forget the, mm -hmm. the fact that uh, we also, as, as believers in the Bible, that we know there is a supernatural source as our Creator, our loving Heavenly Father, but we also know there's a demonic force but maybe the rest of the world doesn't understand that, the, the idea or uh, understanding yet. But what about just our mind, you know, wanting to believe things and then sort of somehow manifesting themselves through that? Well, so I think most people struggle with where did we come from, where are we going? We've just sort of touched on that in one aspect, if you like. But the Bible talks a lot about deception. What does it actually mean? It's a sort of a word we throw away, but to be deceived actually means you're going to be conned into something uh, that is not true. That's what deception means. And we know, for example, what about illusions? We know that our very senses themselves can be deceived. As I mentioned on that clip, there's about 150 UFO sightings every day. Now, 90 to 95 percent can be explained usually as man-made phenomena or satellites. In fact, the most common mistake in UFO is the planet Venus. So just there alone, you see, people are looking at the planet Venus and thinking, well, I'm seeing a UFO. Now, what do they mean when they say UFO? See, our society has been preconditioned to this idea of extraterrestrial life. I like to use the example. Imagine 150 years ago, a, a farmer's putting his cows to bed one night and he sees strange lights moving around the sky. Now, people were more sort of religiously disposed, I suppose, in the past. He might say, well, it's a trick of the starlight or it's an angel, maybe it's a demon. But today, if that farmer had the same experience, what would be the first thing he'd say? He'd say... Somebody's after my cow. Well, yeah, he'd say, yeah, the, my cows are going to get abducted in the middle of the night or something, right? Yeah. Uh, or mutilated, as they yeah. think. But, yeah, he, he says UFO as in meaning, not an un unidentified flying object, but, you know, spacecraft performing, you know, physics-defying feats and gu guided by intelligent beings. And really, that's caused an acceleration in these beliefs, and I think that's what's created an entry point for the deception, because so many people are prone to that idea. You can imagine, you and I wear spiritual glasses, and I'd, I'd, I'd even ask non-Christians watching this show to take heed, because uh, if something stood at the bottom of your bed in the middle of the night and said, I'm from the planet Zook Howard, I've, I've chosen you, you're special, I've got a message for you, and I can name several very, very prominent religions today and their leaders who have all had this visitor experience where they've been visited. Long before there was science fiction and UFOs and flying saucers and spacecraft, they had visitations from people claiming to be angels or whatever that gave them extra revelation. And, and today we see the same thing happening. We see 
you know, Rail, for example. I don't know if you've heard of him, this uh, um, guy that claims he's met Jesus. He's got tens of thousands of followers all over the world. These were the people that were involved in clone aid, uh, claimed they'd cloned a baby uh, right, and were asked yes, to produce yes. it. I met these guys at a UFO conference. You know, like Answers in Genesis, we have our tables there. We're trying to get the information. And they had their tables there. And I'd read somewhere that Rail said um, he'd gained over half a billion dollars worth of publicity through this cloning the child issue. And when I mentioned that to this guy at the table, he said, oh, yes, we're very happy. We have many people coming to us now. And he corrected me, but he said, we don't call him by that name. We call him the Messiah. No. Yes, and that's okay. why I was corrected. Wow. So you see this hope in salvation mm. from oh, above, yeah. but it's wrapped up in a, a quasi or pseudo technology mm. because advanced extraterrestrials are going to come and save us, you know, from holes in our ozone and nuclear war, and they're all going to take the UFO believers off to a super technological paradise, aka heaven or something like that. So these people who don't wear spiritual glasses, if you had that experience, Howard, you'd pretty much know where that came from. The Bible tells us to be discerning. Galatians actually warns us. It says, but even if we or another angel from heaven preached a gospel other than the one we gave to you, let him be eternally condemned. So we get a heads up there that even angels can appear to us and preach a false doctrine. They're fallen angels, part of the spiritual battle. For someone who's not a Christian, that experience is actually real. Mm -hmm. It's not real aliens, but they're having a real experience and the worst thing we can do as Christians is to deny that experience. But what we can do is look at the messages these people are receiving and we can point out that they're, they're wrong, they're false, they're hollow, and these beings are not really benevolent mm. beings, they're malevolent beings. Now, for those that have read the Bible, it's probably a little easier to uh, have that discerning mm. uh, or that discernment. But those who are experiencing these things and are actually genuinely believing them um, and going off and forming organizations and, uh, and followers, you know, what would you say to them? Uh, just, I mean, you've mentioned a couple of points, but what would you say to them to help them to get back on track? Well, it's a very powerful deception, as I said, because the experience is real. Uh, often there is, uh, it's a bit difficult, but there are forms of abuse um, that we even see humans doing to each other as a control mechanism. So these entities try to control people and use them for their purpose. Now, one of the interesting things is when these contacts really first started uh, in the modern age in the 40s and 50s, for example, these beings said, you know, we're from Venus and from Jupiter and Saturn and we hadn't explored much of our own solar system. Mm -hmm. We now know that there's no life capable on those planets. And so the messages that they were telling us were wrong. In fact, they weren't wrong, they were actually lies. And when we look at the prophecies, if you like, the future events, because a lot of this is tied up in future events, a lot of these messages that these millions of people have received have been incorrect. And one of the tests of a true prophet, if you look at God's word, a true prophet, and even Christians, I would say, in the church need to be aware of this, a true prophet is always 100% correct. Right, otherwise he gets stoned. But today, he doesn't seem to get stoned, does he? <laughs> I mean, it was an Old Testament... Uh, uh, law or preset that if he did prophesy and it didn't come true, well be tied in because he, his life was at risk. Yeah. So if we had that sort of law, maybe there'd be far less prophecies today. But in all seriousness, one of the greatest prophets that ever lived, uh, and for me, he uh, showed that he was a true man of God, is, um, you know, Elijah. Mm. Now, many people would use his experience, the way that he left this earth, it was very unusual. There's probably a couple of other people like Enoch who was translated, taken away. Even Moses, they don't know where his body was. Uh, but those like Ezekiel, uh, sorry, like, um, sorry, there is Ezekiel, Ezekiel and there is Elijah. Elijah there, yeah. there, you know, what were those experiences? Uh, can we take them? We can <laughs> take them as gospel. But what about people looking from the outside? Well, again, let me just share from experience. I was at a UFO conference and a guy said, you know, what am I doing there? What do I believe? And I told him I was a Bible-believing Christian. And he said, oh, well, the Bible talks about UFOs. And this is very common, you see, because, again, they're trying to explain it naturalistically in terms of technology. And he said, uh, Ezekiel saw a, a flying saucer. And this is covered in my book, by the way, at length, so just a snapshot here. But I pointed out to him, Ezekiel's own words himself say, I was given a vision of God. It's black and white. Yep. You have the craft, it says it is moving in all directions Eyes at the same time. How can a craft do that? See, that is a description. It's a vision of the omnipresence of God. He's everywhere at once. Mm -hmm. uh, 
It's similar later in Ezekiel, you have the valley of the dry bones. Ezekiel says, I was given a vision. You know, the bones stood up, Point. sinew, there was flesh, you know, they became, you know, people or bodies or something like that. Uh, and was that really happening? No, it was symbolic of the restoration of Israel. And with this sighting that Ezekiel had, he states several times in that passage, people can look it up for themselves, I was given a vision. It was a vision of God. And it was a, a vision because, in a way, it was trying to explain who God was, what he was like, mm. you know. Put that into context, it, it, it's uh, very similar but, uh, as the experience he had when he was taken from where he was in Babylon, right? And taken in the spirit and shown another vision of what was going on in the temple back in Jerusalem. Mm. Quite a few, what, how is it, five or six hundred miles? I don't know what it is. It's quite, yeah. quite a way, isn't it? Um, so that was all vision. That's quite, you know, I've not heard that before, Gary, or reiterated since I was a kid, you know. So it's good to hear that. But what about then Elijah? Well, it says Elijah was raptured into a, uh, a fiery chariot. I mean, and I think that's exactly what it was. The Bible says a fiery chariot. It doesn't describe, you know, a silvery metallic craft or, you know, with, you know, glowing embers or lights or anything. I mean, I think, you know, see, some people think that the Bible's authors are primitive. This is a typical UFO believing view and, and they're trying to describe things that are futuristic or whatever. But I don't think the Bible writers were dumb, Howard. Mm. You know, I think you know, we're quite arrogant today. You know, Adam was the most perfect man that was ever created. And, uh, you know, it says even before the flood, you know, or, or, sorry, um, you know, amongst the patriarchs, there were masters of uh, metallurgy and music and all of these types of things. There were civilizations and cities being built, you know. Tower of Babel. Uh, so they weren't primitive. No. You know, I mean, I've shared with my friend, I'm Australian, as you can tell, and uh, just walking with my friend looking at the Houses of Parliament down the road here today, and I think, wow, when were these built? Look at the architecture and the way. I mean, you know, take man a big effort to do that today. You know, these were built hundreds of years ago. You know, man's always been intelligent from the beginning. I think, you know, uh, um, what was described was just a fiery chariot, and I think it was there for everybody to see, to say, hey, this is the power of God demonstrated, and I'm taking him away. Well, if you want to have uh, an opportunity to speak to Gary, um, we're going to try and open the phone lines. We've got this new phone system, which is, you know, not it's intelligently designed, but it's just us users that don't know how to use it yet. So maybe that's the difference between understanding what the Bible says about the origins of life and why we're here and, and really where we're going. There is a new heaven and a new earth, which is talked uh, quite often in Scripture to Peter. Uh, three talks about what the end of this particular world could be or the earth but also uh, Revelation 21 is very clear now there's a lot of symbolism or what might be termed symbolism but really the Bible as Gary has said and I know that Gen oh, yeah, Answers in Genesis is actually a Bible believing organisation literally will look at the Bible word for word sentence for sentence but um, maybe we'll open the lines I think we've got one more clip or we've got a couple of more clips can we have the next clip have a look at that and give us a call. Here's my favourite, the next generation Star Trek craft. But here we go, he's got to travel, they've got to travel at warp speed. Warp is faster than light. Light speed is 300,000 kilometres per second, right? You've got to travel much faster than that to get around the universe. In fact, if Einstein's right, it'd actually be impossible to travel even at light speed now, just think about what I'm going to say for a minute because it's a bit mind-bending because to travel at light speed, you require a, your, your mass becomes infinite and you require an infinite amount of energy. You'd have to have all the available energy in the universe at your disposal to travel at light speed. Sounds freaky, but that's basically the problem. So they come up with ideas of warp space. They create bubbles in the space-time continuum and travel on those and science fiction to the rescue. See, when they create that and you travel faster than warp, then you've got the trouble of all the occupants getting splattered on the walls and when they accelerate and all this type of stuff. But science fiction to the rescue again, you create inertial dampeners. Heard those? <laughs> Etc. But you know, it's estimated that there's 100,000 uh, dust particles per cubic kilometre of space. at light speed or even let's say even one tenth light speed would be the equivalent of several tons of TNT going off in the spaceship. 
So then you've got to have machines and technology to be available to detect specks of dust in front of you, and so the whole thing uh, really becomes impossible. At light speed. Okay, um, welcome back. You're watching a program live tonight here uh, in the studios in Revelation TV, 19th of April 2005, and we're talking to tonight's guest, Gary Bates, who's from Answers in Genesis. And if you want to get onto their website, answersingenesis.org www.answersingenesis.org there's amazing organization I mean you want to find truth uh, it's all there I have great respect for this organization and you have an opportunity tonight to speak to Gary if you want to call on the number that's going to be on your screen in a minute call that number and we will gladly uh, take your call we may extend the program as I say up we might come back at about midnight and uh, if we get a lot of calls now one call at a time uh, we can only get through because of the way the switchboard is not working. First caller on the line, uh, welcome. Hiya, good evening, caller. Good evening. Um, name, please? My name's Taylor, Pete Taylor. Hi, Pete Taylor, right. Okay, welcome to the program. Quick uh, opportunity to put your question. Uh, according to the, the, the chap giving this talk, like, how many prophecies are left in the Bible? Okay, uh, is that relevant? I mean, uh, let's have a guess. Seventeen uh, percent. Does that help? That are yet to be fulfilled. Most of them have been fulfilled, I would say, about eighty-three uh, percent. If you can do a count quickly uh, in the next ten minutes, give us a call back on the number that's on your screen. Uh, thank you. Next thank caller. You. Can we take your next caller? I'm sorry, I'm not going to be too flippant tonight. I'll just try my best to keep the questions. Uh, to those things that are relevant, we're talking about is there life beyond uh, the universe that we know of uh, or is there something else, is there any proof, have you seen a UFO, have you seen an angel, have you been deceived, do you know the truth uh, about what the Bible talks about as far as uh, angels and demons, I don't know, any other questions you'd like to put, uh, Gary, what do you think? Well, I usually find that um, wherever I go and even entering your station today. People come and share with me their experiences. And so as I say, I started this subject really in terms of trying to provide us solid answers for Christians. I, even though I'm a Christian, Howard, I'd say that I've tried to approach the evidence as objectively as I can. And, uh, you know, my own findings were quite disturbing to me. And uh, I'll give you an example. We had, I was in the Brisbane office and we had a phone call from a lady once. Uh, she was a GP. And she claimed her daughter was being abducted. And she said, well, I'm not sure what's going on. She'd been to churches. And they said, well, she's demon-possessed. She needs deliverance, etc." My wife works for the ministry. And she happened to answer the call. She said, well, my husband's actually writing a book on this subject at the moment. Would you like to talk to him? So I said to this uh, lady, after a brief discussion, I said, look, I think we better meet because either there's something you're not telling me or something your daughter's not even telling you. And she, uh, I went out and had a cup of coffee with her. And then she said, well, you know, Gary, what's going on? And I said, well, you know, has your daughter been told that she's special? Has she been given messages and visions of future events? Uh, has she been given uh, information to sort out the church, basically, you know, to say that the Bible's wrong, etc.? And more disturbingly, and this was the one that clinched it, I said, have there been, um, you know, manifestations and abductions of a sexual nature and as soon as I said that basically a jaw dropped and hit the ground so it was quite fascinating that actually I was able to tell her what was happening to her daughter and uh, for her then she understood that something actually was happening to her daughter she wasn't sure whether it was uh, you know more of a psychosis etc. Okay. We've got our first call, oh, sure. well our next caller actually, Christine, hello Christine welcome hello. to the program. Howard, it's Chrissy from Wrexham here. Hi, Chrissy. Um, hello. Um, hello, Gary. Um, what I wanted to say was three years ago, while I was out in Brazil, um, I stayed there um, with a pastor and his wife that have a ministry in Brazil to the street children. And uh, while you're there, you really have, um, you know, the presence of the Lord is so strong. And the gardens are so beautiful. And it, to go into the house, into the garden with the car, there's big, big gates. And I actually saw two angels, one each side of the gate, protecting, uh, you know, uh, that uh, property and the surrounding area. I saw two angels, and they were in bodily form. 
I can't say they were just, I knew that they were angels because there was such um, um, a beautiful piece about them, you know. OK, and, uh, Chrissy, Chrissy, just hang on a sec because we're running short of time. Yeah. Let Gary come back to you on this very quickly. Yeah. OK, well, f first thing, I wouldn't say, I would not deny that you've seen angels. Yeah. I mean, that could be the case. Yeah. Uh, but I'd also say it might not be the case. How would you discern that? So d in terms of what I've just been talking about tonight, you see, yeah. lots of people have claimed visitations from angels, yeah. etc., as well. And because that experience is so real, what we have to always be careful is that experience doesn't supersede what is in God's Word. Uh -huh. So if an angel appears and gives you messages that is in accordance with God's Word, and, and glorifies God, if you like, uh -huh. then I would say, well, you know, that, that's, that, that might be a sound basis for looking at that. But, you know, I've met lots and lots of people who've had experiences and claim they've met angels, and the passage I read out before in, uh, in Galatians says, remember, even if we or an angel from heaven should visit you and preach a gospel other than the one we've be given you, mm -hmm. let him be eternally condemned. The discerning factor there is the Word of God. See, that, that is the beginning and the end for us. As Christians, that's what we rely upon. That's where we know is truth. That is our filter for truth. We use that to discern everything, even the supernatural realm about us. Mm. Chrissy, thank you very okay, much. thank you. God thank bless. Bye-bye. Hopefully, you two will be able to get through tonight. And if uh, we extend this program after 12 o'clock uh, tonight, you can also talk to Gary. Uh, and in the wee hours, it seems that a lot of people have a little bit more courage. But take heart we are trying to get all the calls through unfortunately we can't get as many as we used to because of the phone system anyway there's a, one more clip the spiritual aspect really of ufos is there a side of that well what we're using here the book um uses the research of the prominent movers and shakers in other words you don't have to take little joe christian's word for this uh it the book relies upon the research of those who have been investigating for many years you're going to see a, a, a quote i think by John Keel. And John Keel uh, is probably the number three, I say, ufologist in the world. He doesn't approach it with a pre belief. He tried to just look at the evidence. And I think what he has to say in the quote, well, I'm reading it, but it will be interesting. Okay, have a listen to this. John Keel, he's a guy that wrote The Mothman Prophecies, a movie with Richard Gere. Very, very cogent researcher and uh, quite a good guy. He says the UFOs do not seem to exist as tangible manufactured objects. They do not conform to the natural laws of our environment. They seem to be nothing more than transmogrifications tailoring themselves to our abilities to understand. The thousands of contacts with the entities indicate that they are liars and put on artists. The UFO manifestations seem to be by and large merely minor variations of the old age demonological phenomenon. It's the same old stuff dressed up in the emperor's new clothes. OK, now, if you're interested in getting hold of the book, uh, Gary, tell us where they can get this, The Alien Intrusion. Yeah, they can get it from the Answers in Genesis website. There's a, uh, an online bookstore. If they look across the top uh, and a tab, I think there's even a link on the front page. Or they can contact our Answers in Genesis office here in the United Kingdom. I'll just read out the number. Uh, 0116. 270-8400. Okay, say that again, Gary. Just yep, it's 0116-270-8400. Answers in Genesis UK. We've got an office right here. Okay, keep that number on the screen. Uh, if you've got another caller, we'll take that because we do need... Mike from Liverpool, welcome to the program. Hello. Oh, Mark. Sorry, Mark. It's hard for me to hear. They're screaming in the back there. Anyway, uh, carry on with the, your question. I love your programme, by the way. Thank you. Um, I've been meaning to phone for a long, long time. I'm a little bit nervous. Uh, oh. I've had dreams right. about UFOs for the last 10 or 15 years. And I kind of knew that they were like something in the future. This is before like, UFOs were popular, really. Um, and I just knew like, you know, it was the future and it was from God that uh, the dreams were from, showing me what was going to happen. Uh, and I had a dream about, about six months ago now, and it was about the rapture, and I never even heard about the rapture at all. I'm on like a, um, a lovely ocean on water skis, and I'm trying to get on this, this lovely white yacht, and I'm going up, up the side of the yacht, and I'm falling down, falling down, getting up, falling down, and then eventually I make it, and I'm on the yacht, and I'm no sooner I'm on the, I'm on the yacht, 
I get taken up into heaven. And then I come back down, and I'm actually with God. And the earth's like scorched. And I'm like nervous coming down. And I think I'm going to fall. And God says to me, you know, what are you nervous for? Are you with me? And then I like flung myself down to the um, to the earth. And then we land, and I turn. And I just know we're going to the mountain of God. I don't really understand that. But the dream ended. So the next night, your program was all about the rapture. Soul 11 was about the rapture. And... So you, 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 was about it. And... That's just like kind of like mm. God's done that a few times, you know. With the okay, Mark. Remember, nervous, but anyway. Yeah, Mark, don't, don't go. Just a second. Uh, listen to this. What about dreams? Because dreams and visions are something which uh, are going to come in the end of days. It, it talks about, yeah. you know. I think that, uh, as I said to the earlier caller, what's the divining rod? It's the, it's the word. That's. You know, if in fact, why we have the word. If it, in other words, if it's in harmony with the word, if if it's if it's not alien, if I can use that yep. word, uh, or contrary to what God's word is saying, um, then it could be something that's confirming that gives people uh, an opportunity to see a little bit of what's coming. Of right? course, it is, and I think. But but if I could again caution, I mean, even in the churches we see today, that sometimes there is a greater emphasis placed upon these elements. Than, this, than, than perhaps the word, you know, where, well, you know, and I, I, again, I'm not trying to uh, be the, uh, the paramount sceptic here. I was going to say, you could dampen everybody's spirits here, but... Of but course, these things can happen, but I would say, you know, just make sure they're in accordance with the, with the, with the word and, uh, and, you know, discern. I mean, Paul warns us time and time again to discern these things. I mean, lots of people are having visions, dreams, and to be frank, how do, you, how do you always know they're from God? Mm -hmm. Well, the only way you know, are they in accordance with his word, right. truthful to his word? And Joel uh, goes into that quite mm. uh, explicitly, and then obviously it's reiterated again, I think, in the book of Acts, that we're going to be seeing signs and wonders as we come closer to the return of the Messiah. But there will be delusions, because that's part and parcel of it, and even says even the elect might. Matthew 24, There's, there be shall deceived. be false Christs and false prophets. And you know, Howard, I've actually seen more false Jesuses mm -hmm. in the UFO movement than anywhere else. Yeah. And these people claim to have visions and revelations of, and particularly of future events. That seems to be one of the uh, strongest characteristics we see. A lot of these are about the future. People are fascinated with the future. I mean, that's yeah. why science fiction is so popular. Yeah. Even Christians are fascinated with the future. We are. And are you fascinated with the future? Do you want to know what is ahead? Of course you do. Uh, who would like to know what tomorrow is going to hold? But there is something in the Bible which is what got my interest, Gary, is when I was 21, if somebody had told me Jesus loved me, I don't think I would have really comprehended or fully wanted to understand that. But when somebody showed me from the Bible that these prophecies that were prophesied thousands of years ago had come to, some of them had come to fulfillment. Even just that where Jesus was to be born, 500 years before he was born, the, the very place and the times and the seasons and all of those things and the way that Jesus actually had all these powers to, to cause the, even the dead to be raised. Uh, it's pretty powerful stuff. But we have a, another caller. I think it's Ruth. I've got this distorted earpiece. Bruce. Bruce. Hello, Bruce. Hello, Howard. <laughs> How you doing? All right, thank you. Okay, sorry about that. I'm not Ruth. All <laughs> oh, right, yeah. Well, I'm just being prophetic there, but um, or pathetic rather. Uh, go on, Bruce. Ask a question. Oh, thanks, Howard. Gary, uh, I just wanted to say it's it's uh, it's fabulous to see you on the program and uh, to see Answers in Genesis appearing on these t programs. You're such an important organisation. Mm. In fact, you're critical and uh, one of the great organisations for standing up and telling the truth. And uh, thank you for that. I just wanted to say that one of the things that I find very curious about UFO photographs particularly is that uh, they're always fuzzy. They're never clear. I just wondered whether you'd have ever ex seen any that were clear, that were actually recognisable. Well, on the, uh, Bruce, on the DVD where we're showing clips there, I actually show clips of fraudulent UFOs. Um, as I've said, 90 to 95% can be explained as natural man-made phenomena, ball lightning, those types of things. Um, planet Venus, mistaken satellites, but I actually have some pictures of UFOs that have been seen by multiple witnesses streaking across the star sky, making no noises, etc. So they're too hard to dismiss. I would agree with you, a lot of them are grainy footage. And one of the big problems you have today with technology, and you'd be aware of this, how it is, is uh, 
you know, how do you trust many modern photographs? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they can be so well produced. And I think the best evidence is uh, probably in terms of some of these are, uh, you know, multiple credible witnesses. I went to a UFO conference once and I saw an Anglican reverend. It was called uh, a sighting he had in New Guinea called the Gill Sighting. And he was a missionary in Papua New Guinea. And, and dozens and dozens of people saw this thing. It was really bizarre. It wasn't just those balls of light. This was a shiny, silvery uh, craft. It flipped its lid. Some little beings stood up and waved at him. How do you explain those types of things, seen by multiple witnesses? Too much pizza? Could be. Well, <laughs> Something know. in the water, perhaps. <laughs> Somebody once said to me, had I had too much pizza when I had a couple of experiences. But, you know, that's, that was personal to me, uh, and it was purposeful, too. Uh, because there, there was some reason for those appearances. Now, you may have had that too. Remember, Mary had that. Uh, she didn't know that she was going to be expecting uh, to conceive and to have the Messiah. I mean, what uh, an experience, what a privilege. But nevertheless, you know, was she scared? Yes, she was. When that angel came, she was terrified. And the fear of God comes all over you. There are many experiences in the Bible where those angels had appeared. And look at Abraham. Uh, bless his heart, he went out there and uh, into the desert and said, welcomed these guys. You know, he didn't know he was entertaining. It says in the scripture, you will... Some have entertained angels without, without knowing it. it. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Now, that's, um, that's interesting. Are you an angel? Okay. Definitely not. All right. I'm a sinner. <laughs> right. Hallelujah. Oh. We're all sinners. Uh, sorry, don't get excited, too excited. You know, this is a serious program. Now... Give us a call on the line uh, if you've got a question. Uh, let's see, do you think, let's get a feel for this. Um, I know you can't vote right now. We're going to have interactive TV very soon. But if you could uh, somehow supernaturally convey to me in the next 30 seconds whether we should extend this program and come back at 12 midnight. And what we're asking for is some supernatural way <laughs> to get Gary back to Kent. Just a practical issue. Uh, do, did I hear a, we're not allowed to ask for sponsors on the air? But uh, if you want to pray for some supernatural or even just a natural way to get Gary uh, after sometime in the wee hours of the morning back to Kent, uh, give us a call. Anne, welcome to the program, Anne. Hello, Quick Howard. Hello. Nice to speak to you again. Yeah. Um, lovely, this program that you've got on tonight. Um, I just heard a story mm -hmm. um, about these people trying to put out the thing that there's aliens and spacecraft. Mm -hmm. And um, they're trying to do it so that when the Antichrist comes and the rapture occurs, that they'll be able to tell people that um, we haven't been raptured, we've been taken, by, taken away by spacecraft. Right. That's interesting. But the fact that we're all Christians, that's, you know, Christ, some Christian UFO, maybe, that it's waiting up there in the sky for us? Yeah. Thank well. you. Uh, if you'd like to listen off there, because we've got to try and get another call. Thanks. Okay. Well, on, on that one, again, I covered in my book, as we know, there are different views about the rapture within the Christian church. So how, how do we reconcile all of those things? I would not take a dogmatic view on one, uh, particularly in terms of future events. I think, again, uh, we need to be careful about being dogmatic about them. But put it this way, it is plausible that millions of Christians could disappear from the face of the earth and it could be explained as, uh, as, as UFOs. That is quite possible. In fact, the UFO literature itself, again, covered in my book, you'll see is um, replete with these ideas of raptures and uh, sometimes it's, uh, I think they describe as the fuddy-duddies who are holding Mother Earth, stopping, back, uh, stopping her ascending into her next stage of evolution or something like that. In other cases, it's the UFO believers that are taken away. And again, one of the tests you see is they can't all be right. <laughs> mm. But we will know when that time comes from exactly what happens. And I, I, I would not say, uh, as some are in the habit of doing, this will definitely be what will happen in the last days. Of course it's possible, but we'll know when it happens. All right. Jacob, uh, are you from the past or the present? With a name I'm like that. I'm from the present. Okay, Jacob, a new question. Um, I just wanted to quickly make the comment that the film Close Encounters actually inadvertently gives the game away. It shows UFO witnesses who are in their houses and the furniture is all moving around. And it, the UFO community should realise that, um, you know, people who witness UFOs close up also experience poltergeist effects in their houses. And we know that people who mess about with Ouija boards, etc., also get the same effects. So therefore, you know, why, why, why isn't there a link? in the minds of the UFO community between, you know, Ouija boards, the occult, 
and, and UFOs. You know, it's like they got their blinkers on. You know, we want we want them to be extraterrestrial so much that we ignore the uh, the poltergeist effects. Very interesting. Good question, that Jacob. Um, I'm going to ask you to probably ring back uh, in the next. We are going to extend this. We've got a slot become available 11:30 this evening. Would you take part in that, Jacob? Um, yeah, I'll ring back. Yeah. Thank you very much. And any of the others that. Uh, Let's try and deal with Jacob's question there in the next one minute. OK, well, I think that's the best question we've had tonight, Jacob. It's very discerning of you because uh, if you read my book, you'll see that UFO experiences uh, are very, very similar in their morphology to out-of-body experiences, near-death experiences, uh, balls of light appearing in rooms, and as you rightly say, tarot cards, uh, Ouija boards provide an entry point for these things. It seems amazing that UFOs want to travel or aliens want to travel millions of light years across the universe basically to tell us our Bible's wrong. I want to say so much. It's really getting uh, going to heat up. But tune in tonight at 11.30. This is the 19th of April, so it's going to be live. We've got Gary Bates uh, from Answers in Genesis all the way from down under. So opportunity before he goes and flies off tomorrow morning. Uh, give us uh, an opportunity to answer your calls and your good questions, like Jacob's. Uh, so, just in the closing minute here, literally, uh, just to, just, what did you do in America? I mean, the, the interest that was there was phenomenal, wasn't it? Well, the book was launched in January, and I did a five-week tour of the states and uh, a very prominent radio program uh, called Coast to Coast, which deals with the paranormal, etc. Said, hey, what's this Christian uh, doing? writing about UFOs. I was invited to go onto the show. I later found out how this show is the fourth highest rating radio show in the United States. And I took callbacks like this, mainly from non-Christians. And uh, there was such an interest, and that's why I encourage Christians, not just as a plug for the book, but it's a subject matter that we can link with the culture out there. Uh, and the book went to about number 24 on Amazon.com as a result. So. Brilliant. OK, in the closing seconds, I want to say to you, if you're watching by Classics TV, make the switch tonight to 676 Revelation TV in plenty of time to watch this as we continue it at 11.30. Thank you very much for watching Revelation TV. Good night.